السلام عليكم ورحمة الله وبركاته بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم الحمد لله وكفى وسلام على عباده الذين اصطفى أما بعد أعوذ بالله من الشيطان الرجيم بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم وقل ربي زدني علما صدق الله العظيم We thank Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala for giving us another opportunity of learning the basics and the essentials of our deen. We were busy with Surah Al-Falaq and the concept that we had done, which was something new which we had done, was the concept of Qalqala. And the concept of Qalqala, to recap, is there are five letters of Qalqala. And whenever these five letters are found, Qaf, Ta, Ba, Jim, and Dal, and if they are found with a sukun, a jazm on it, then it will be read with an echoing sound known as qalqala. Now, if there is a sakin, a jazm on it, it will be read with qalqala. And there are three different stages of qalqala. One is if the letter is found in the middle of the word, it will be the least form. Thereafter, if the letter, if the sukun is found on any of these letters at the end of a letter, it will be slightly higher. And the greatest form or the highest form of Qalqala will be where any of these five letters are found with a tashdeed on it at the end of a word. So to recap, the words that we had done was Uqad, so the Dal with a Sukun on it, when we're stopping on it, so it will be read with an echoing sound. Similarly, the word Qaf, Ta, Ba, Jim, any of these letters, if they have got a Jazm, a Sukun on it, then it will be read with the quality of qalqala, which is known, which is an echoing sound. So to do our next ayat for today, we'll be doing a few more ayat of Surah Al-Falaq, inshallah. A'udhu billahi min ash-shaytan rajim bismillahi rahman rahim So we had already done, قُلْ أَعُوذُ بِرَبِّ الْفَلَقَ مِنْ شَرِّ مَا خَلَقَ وَمِنْ شَرِّ غَاسِقٍ إِذَا وَقَبْ now we go on to the next one. Wamin Shadrin again noon sakin. After noon sakin, there is a letter of ikhfa, so we will have ikhfa here. Ra with a kasra on it will be read with an empty mouth. So Wamin Shadrin Nafati fil uqad. Now here the tha must be read clearly, not nafasati, but rather nafathati. Now, very often in the Quran, we tend to make a mistake between the tha and the sin. So here, it is not nafasati, nafathati. And tha will be pronounced by the tip of the tongue, touching the edges of the two top front teeth. So, وَمِن شَرِّ النَّفَّاثَاتِ Now, another letter which we come across today is the letter fa. Now, the fa will be pronounced when... The edges of the bottom teeth, the front bottom teeth, will touch the inside of the bottom lip. So, nafa, nafa, if you put the bottom, the edges of the front teeth will touch the inner part of the bottom lip. So, nafa, thati. So, again, important here, the tha, and then we did the where is the fa pronounced from? Fil uqand. Fil uqand. Dal, with a sukun on it because we are stopping, will be read with the quality of qalqala. So again, wa min sharrin nafathati fil uqand. Then the last ayah of the surah, again, noon sakin after the sheen, so we're going to have ikhfa. Ra with a kasra, empty mouth, and then dal will be read with qalqala, and here dal not to be read as za. Wa min sharri hasidin idha hasad. Again, ya ha not to be read as hasidin, but hasidin. Lastly, the word ya. Dal and then the ha immediately thereafter also to be read clearly. Wa min sharri hasidin idha hasad. One of the letters which we had done was the hamza must always be read very very clearly. So if you notice, hasidin idha, not hasidin idha, 
But rather the Hamza must be clearly pronounced. Ida wa min sharri hasidin ida hasad. Hasidin ida hasad. Now, sometimes when we are reading it fast, we tend to join the two. Hasidin ida, hasidin ida. That should not be read, but rather the Hamza must be read clearly it is, as its own letter. So we're going to read now Surah Al-Fatiha and then the entire Surah Al-Falaq, inshallah. So thus far we have covered some very important concepts like that of Ikhfa and that of Al-Qala. Then the important letters we have already covered. Also, we have covered the importance of reading the Hamza very, very clearly. This is something that we should always keep in mind. أعوذ بالله من الشيطان الرجيم بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم الحمد لله رب العالمين الرحمن الرحيم مالك يوم الدين إياك نعبد وإياك نستعين إهدنا الصراط المستقيم صراط الذين أنعمت عليهم غير المغضوب عليهم ولا الضالين بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم قل أعوذ برب الفلق من شر ما خلق ومن شر غاسق إذا وقب ومن شر النفاثات في العقد ومن شر حاسد إذا حسد صدق الله العظيم That concludes our lesson of Tajweed for today. We now continue with the lesson of fiqh. So previously we had done ghusl and the bathing in according to the Islamic way and we mentioned what will make ghusl farad and we stated that it will be the discharge of uh, the semen from a, from a male, the wet dream, relationship with the, fam with the wife and together with that relationship with the spouse and lastly hayr and nifaz. So the period, the monthly period of a woman together with that the bleeding after childbirth. So when all of these conclude, then ghusl will become compulsory. Ghusl is also recommended on a few occasions. So for example, at the, on the day of Jum'ah, it is recommended for a person to take a ghusl. This is a sunnah of Rasulullah wasallam, mentioned in many, many ahadith. Man ghusla, a person who takes a ghusl on the day of Jum'ah. Together with that, on the two days of Eid, it is also sunnah to take a bath, to take a ghusl. When a person enters into ihram, the state of ihram, prior to performing hajj or umrah, it is also uh, recommended to perform, uh, to perform ghusl. And lastly, on the day of Arafah, for those who are performing hajj on the day of Arafah, may Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala bless us all with many occasions of hajj and umrah that is accepted in the eyes of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So these are the few times when uh, making ghusl would be recommended according to the sunnah of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. So to conclude the discussion on ghusl today, just to recap, how do we perform ghusl? Our intention obviously is to perform ghusl, to purify ourselves from all impurity. And if it is an occasion of a sunnah ghusl, then that should be part of our intention. Thereafter, to wash the hands firstly, Secondly, to wash the private parts and remove all forms of najasa, all forms of impurities that are found on the body. Thereafter, to make a complete wudu. And lastly, to pour water over the entire body to make sure that not a single hair on the entire body is left without being wet, without being uh, covered in water. So this is the importance of ghusl and this is what we need to keep in mind. Now, 
the most important thing to stress on ghusl is that if it is a farad ghusl, to ensure that the entire body is wet. Now, this is the crux of it. And obviously, to put water into the mouth and to put water into the nostrils are also part of the three uh, faraid. But to keep this in mind with regard to ghusl, that is the conclusion of the lesson on ghusl. Tomorrow, inshallah, we will now start with the lesson on tayammum. And sometimes we feel tayammum, when am I going to make tayammum? Yes, there are many occasions in life when we need to make tayammum. So it is important for us to know these rules and these masail. We now continue with the lesson of tafsir. And in this particular lesson, we had previously done where Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa had come to the arsh of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa had praised Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in words that Nabi sallallahu alayhi wa said he did not know and he would not know until that moment because Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will inspire Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa with those words and then Nabi sallallahu alayhi wa will praise Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. It is at that occasion that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will say to Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, Ya Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, Irfa' ra'sak, sal tu'ata, ishfa' tushaffa'. That O oh Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, raise your head, ask you shall be given, intercede, your intercession will be accepted. And that occasion is a beautiful time when Nabi sallallahu alayhi wa sallam will say to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, Ya Rabbi ummati, ummati, O oh Allah, my ummah, my ummah. I'm worried about my people. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will say those consoling words. Sanurdika fi ummatik. O Nabi of Allah, we will keep you pleased and happy with regard to your ummah. Now that is the benefit of having iman. That is the benefit of believing in Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam is the Prophet of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. That no matter what a person does in the world, even if a person, may Allah forbid, has to be punished or has to be, go through difficulty to wipe out his sins, at the end of the day, that person who even has an iota of Iman will still enter Jannah. And that is what Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa will ensure that this Ummah benefits from. Thereafter, the Hisab starts. Now the reckoning actually starts. Now the different forms of reckoning, because this is Maliki Yawmiddin that we are discussing. Master of the Day of Judgment, the Day of of, of, of us answering to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. This is what Maliki Yawmiddin is all about. Now, the different levels of hisab, one form of hisab is where a person will be called to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will take the hisab one on one. So, a person will be in front of Allah and Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will now remind this person of all of his sins. The words used is yuqarriruhu. He will be made to acknowledge. So, he will be told, you did this and the person will admit. You have done this, he will admit. And he will not argue. He will know that these are all the sins that I have done. And that is Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says that what will the, what will the non-believers say? مَا لِهَذَا الْكِتَابِ What is wrong with this book? لَا يُغَادِرُ صَغِيرَةً وَلَا كَبِيرَةً إِلَّا أَحْصَاهَا What is wrong with this book of deeds? It hasn't left out neither the minute details nor the major events. Everything are put in front of a person. لَا يُغَادِرُ صَغِيرَةً وَلَا كَبِيرَةً إِلَّا أَحْصَاهَا وَوَجَدُوا مَا عَمِلُوا Hadira, and everybody will find exactly what they had done in the world right in front of them. And don't for a moment think that Allah will oppress anyone. No. Only what a person did in this world will he find in front of him on the day of which Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala refers to as Yawm al-Din. Now, when Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala tells a person, a believer, you did this, he will acknowledge. You did this, he will acknowledge. So, iqrar, he will, he will accept that, yes, Allah, I was wrong and I had perpetrated these sins. Now, the fortunate ones are those, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will say to them on the day of Qiyamah, inni satartuha alayka fi dunya. You know, my servant, when you did this in the world, I hid it, I concealed it. I covered up your faults in the world. And today, I forgive them for you. So in the world, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala covered a person's faults. And Allah says, I covered it in the world. Now in the Akhirah, I am forgiving you, O my servant. So this is one of the best, uh, one of the best situations that a person can have. That Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala forgives all of a person's sins. Now, in the hadith, it is mentioned that some people will be questioned. That you did this. Yes, why did you do this? 
How could you do this when I had given you all of this? Manuqish al hisab, the person who has got an intense reckoning. Halak, that person is destroyed. In another narration, illa uddib, that in itself is a punishment. To go through the entire hearing procedure in itself is a very difficult thing. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala protect us all from that. Now, when a person is questioned and all the questioning will start, this Ummah of Nabi sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, who will be the largest of all the nations, came last in the world, but their hisab will be done first. Why? Because Jannah will not be, entrance into Jannah will not be allowed for any prophet until Nabi sallallahu alayhi wa sallam himself enters. And Jannah will not be, will not be allowed for any nation until this Ummah enters into Jannah. So this Ummah came last, but their hisab will be done first so that they may enter into Jannah. Thereafter, when a person's reckoning starts, the first thing to be questioned will be Salah. If a person's Salah is in order, everything else will flow smoothly. That is why it is so important for us to give emphasis to Salah. We must give our utmost importance to Salah because the first thing, the first thing that a person will be questioned regarding is salah. Thereafter, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will question a person regarding the affairs between a believer, between a human being and Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala directly. So whatever rights were between the Lord Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and the servant, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will question a person regarding that. When that, in that a person has got great hope, that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will forgive a person. Because these are right, the rights of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Thereafter, you come to a very difficult situation. And that is huququl ibad. That is why we are told, whatever rights we have between us and people, we should fulfill it in this world. Fulfill it on this day, in this life that we have. Before the day comes, when there is no nothing which we can use to settle. There's no dirham in dinar. There's no currency to settle on that day except with our good deeds. So whatever we may have done, let us ask for forgiveness from whoever we may have hurt and let us try and return that the belongings of whoever may have, whoever's rights may have been usurped or whoever has been told a harsh word, let us ask for forgiveness from everybody. So this is when now the, the hisab takes place between, the, between two people. Now that is a difficult situation because if a person cannot settle this dispute, then on that day, what will happen? That is the day when this person's good deeds will be taken to settle whatever he has done wrong. When his good deeds are finished, now his sins, the sins of the person who he oppressed, will be taken away and given to the person, the oppressor. This is such a difficult day. That is why we should try our utmost to settle whatever we have in this world. Another important lesson which we learn regarding this, where, the, where two people have got a dispute. In this world, we may not know, we may never need somebody's help. But in the Akhirah, we don't know whose help we need. That is why as far as possible, we should try and live in a way that we don't have issues with many people. On the day of Qiyamah, there is a narration that says that a person will be, will, will be walking in Jannah. He will come to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala for his reckoning. He will come to Allah and Allah will tell him that you only have one good deed. That's not sufficient for you to go into Jannah. Another person will come to Allah and Allah will tell him that you are short of one deed to go into Jannah. So this, both of them disperse. The person who needed one deed is now walking by and he sees this person sitting and he questions him that, what are you doing here? And he says, I've only got one deed and that's not sufficient to enter me into Jannah. And this person says, but I only need one deed and I cannot enter Jannah until I get one deed. So both of us are in the same position. So the person who has got the one deed says to him, you know what, my one deed is not going to benefit me, but it will benefit you. Take my one good deed and you go to Jannah. So he will come to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and he will say, Ya Rabbi qad wajattu, Ya Rabbi qad wajattu. Oh Allah, I found it, I found it, I've got that one good deed. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, where did you get it from? That person will be summoned. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will tell him, you gave your good deed to this person? He will say, yes. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will say, A'alayya tatasakha? You want to be more generous than me? Now both of you go and enter into Jannah. 
Now, my question is, what if that person who's got the one deed is someone who we had a problem with? May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala resolve all of our issues. May Allah put it in the hearts of whoever we may have hurt for them to forgive us in this world before we leave this world. May Allah give us the ability to forgive all those who have wronged us. So this is where the حقوق ibad will now be taken into consideration. Thereafter, the animal to animal. So if an animal with horns had attacked an animal without horns, Allah will then settle the dispute. Where one animal will be given horns and they will settle the disputes. Another aspect is the relationship between man and animal. So that is why Nabi Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam said that imra'atun an-nar fi hirratin habasatha. A woman was thrown into the fire of Jahannam because of a cat that she had kept in, 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 in captivity and she did not feed the cat. Now our relationship with animals is such that we should not even oppress an animal. If a person has got a pet, then it is important, even if you're going away, you're going on a holiday, to take care of that animal because that is a trust that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has given us. So that is something that is very, very important. Lastly, there will be witnesses on the day of Qiyamah. So the angels will witness against men. The earth will witness against men. That is why we are told, read Salah in as many places as possible. Because the earth will give testimony to the, to the fact that we read Salah on it. Thereafter, a person's own body will testify. And that is what Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala refers to. الْيَوْمَ نَخْتِمُ عَلَىٰ أَفْوَاهِهِمْ وَتُكَلِّمُنَا أَيْدِيهِمْ وَتَشْهَدُ أَرْجُلُهُمْ بِمَا كَانُوا يَكْسِبُونَ Allah says on that day we will seal the person's mouth, the hands will talk, the feet will talk and testify. May Allah never ever put us through that situation. And lastly, there is a group that we should all make dua to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala that we can be amongst them. Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam stated that there will be 70,000 people who will enter Jannah bila hisab with absolutely no reckoning. So this 70,000 people are those who don't take assistance from anybody. What do they do? Ala rabbihim yatawakkalun. They only put their trust in Allah. They don't turn to anyone for help. They don't ask others for help. They only and solely put their trust in Allah. What did Nabi Sallallahu say? These will be the 70,000. When Nabi Sallallahu Alaihi narrated this, Sahaba radiallahu anhu who knew what the difficulties of Hisab are, one Sahabi stood up and he said, O oh, Nabi of Allah, make dua that I am amongst them. Nabi Sallallahu Alaihi said, Anta minhum, you are amongst them. Another Sahabi who saw the opportunity, he stood up, he says, O oh, Nabi of Allah, make dua that I am in amongst them. Nabi Sallallahu Alaihi said, Sabaqa kabiha ukasha. Ukasha, radiallahu an, has beat you to it. He is already amongst them. We should always ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to make us amongst those who will not have to undergo the hisab on the day of Qiyamah. And it is nothing on Allah. وَمَا ذَلِكَ عَلَى اللَّهِ بِعَزِيزِ It is so simple for Allah. We should always make dua. Don't make dua for, for, for easy hisab. Make dua and say, Allah, you are great. You are, you are merciful. You are kind. Oh Allah, enter us into Jannah without hisab. May Allah bless us all with that. May Allah bless you and your family and your loved ones. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala keep us all safe. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala bless us all. And may Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala remove this difficulty from the entire world. Until we meet again. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh.